Good evening. It's a great pleasure to welcome all of you here tonight for the 2013 uh, Dickinson College Arts Award. We have the distinct pleasure of having Sue Ko with us this evening, and I think all of you can look forward to a very uh, lively evening of discussion. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to ask everyone to please turn off your cell phones so we're not unduly interrupted, if you haven't already done that. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Professor Elizabeth Lee. I teach in the Art History Department. And um, as you can see from your program, um, I'm going to be giving a few introductory remarks um, and then pass the baton on to other folks um, who will take us from there. Let's see, can we dim the lights a bit on the stage? Thank you. Ooh, perfect. Art historians get nervous if they have to talk with too much light on. <laughs> Sue Ko is one of the most important social protest artists working in the art world today. She considers herself a graphic witness who uses her pen, ink, and paintbrush to draw attention to issues of racial injustice, disease, sexual violence, economic exploitation, war, and animal cruelty in a manner that text alone cannot. Her work is routinely compared to the trenchant and often wrenching scenes of 19th century artists such as Francesco Goya and Henri Daumier who use their art as a vehicle for exposing truth, often in macabre and grotesque ways. Her prints, paintings, and drawings appear in prominent collections across the country, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Hirshhorn Museum, and the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Yet she has always cultivated an audience beyond the art-going public. When she left London for New York in 1972, she sold her first illustrations for the op-ed pages of the New York Times, and since then has extensively published her work in the Times and other periodicals, including Rolling Stone, Newsweek, Mother Jones, and The Nation. Since 1983, Coe has also produced a number of books that include both her art and her writing, with such provocative titles as How to Commit Suicide in South Africa, Dead Meat, Sheep of Fools, and Cruel. It is telling that among her credentials is a long list of colleges and universities where she has lectured, held workshops, and served as a visiting artist. Education is central to her mission, as we've had the privilege to see through her three-day residency at Dickinson, which has included visits to multiple classes, meals with students and faculty, and two major public events. Her wor work will remain with us over the next few months through the Trout Gallery exhibition, The Ghosts of Our Meat, engaging us in conversation and challenging us to take up the issues which Coe's work represents. For the most part, we are already aware of the issues as Coe takes her subject matter from the news. But the abstract horror one imagines while reading the news assumes concrete form in one of Coe's arresting paintings, drawings, or prints. She takes us into a dark and hellish universe, more terrifying than what we could have imagined, fully aware, aware of the power of the visual to transform our thinking at the most fundamental level. Her unwavering commitment is to teach people to see, which is harder than it might seem. As Coe puts it, quote, people think they're seeing and they're not seeing. This is one of the hardest things to unlearn. How to create change is to start to see and realize that the way you were seeing is very distorted, end quote. The sheer act of witnessing is the first critical step. In her words, you have to try to see reality and not invent anything. Coe's first book, How to Commit Suicide in South Africa, shed light on the detention of prisoners in South Africa, including Stephen Biko, the founder of the South African Students' Organization and leader of the Black Consciousness Movement in South Africa. The book's title refers to the claim by authorities that the student activists and others who died in prison who committed suicide. Its publication coincided with the anti-apartheid movement on college campuses and became a popular organizing tool, requiring a second printing of 5,000 copies that were distributed throughout the U.S. and England. The book's centerfold South Africa was inspired by a newspaper photograph, and you can see that in the bottom right-hand corner of the image there, of a woman about to be whipped by men in dog skull masks. Her hands are bound by a rope held by President Ronald Reagan, who is being shot at by a black man. In another work, We Come Grinning Into Your Paradise, Co shows a man on the table, his limbs splayed, being tortured by five monsters. The dollar sign and pound sign that mark the palms of the monster at far right represent the inextricable link Co sees between a capitalist economy and social oppression. After South Africa, the artist explains that she, quote, wanted to do something about America, 
about racism here and not just as something exotic and far away, end quote. The result was a series of drawings and paintings about Malcolm X, a figure who appealed to Coe both as a revolutionary hero and as someone with a background similar to many other blacks in urban America. As part of her research, she read everything published on Malcolm X, including his FBI records, and visited places connected to him, such as the Audubon Ballroom, where he was assassinated in 1965. The images depict events in Malcolm's life from his early years to his death, and facts about his life are interwoven with the American Civil Rights Movement, events in South Africa and Vietnam, as well as American pop culture. Her book, X, uh, in parenthesis, The Life and Times of Malcolm X, was published in 1986 with text by journalist Judith Moore and was accompanied by an exhibition at PS1 in New York. On the heels of this project, Coe's mini retrospective police state opened at the Anderson Gallery in Richmond, Virginia, and included over 30 works created between 1982 and 1986, as well as an entire room devoted to her op-ed illustrations for the New York Times. The works in this show took up a range of charged political topics, such as US military aid to El Salvador, the US supported overthrow of Haitian President Jean-Claude Duvalier, and the US bombing of a mental hospital in Grenada where dozens of patients were killed. Many works in this exhibition focused on domestic politics, particularly in New York City. Woman in Prison, for example, depicts a half-naked female prisoner bent over with her eyes closed, mouth ajar, and her head clasped between her hands. Accompanying text highlights the conditions of the prisoners, describing the poor diet, inadequate medical treatment, and unsanitary facilities, reflecting a system that breeds mental degradation and physical deterioration, those are Coe's uh, words, among a population of mostly black and Puerto Rican poor women. The circumstances of the prisoners are not unlike the homeless Coe attends to in works such as homeless women living in the toilet at Penn Station, depicting a group, group of women crouched and lying destitute in a stark train station restroom. In Police State, we see some of Coe's earliest work on animal rights. In vivisection, two scientists perform their operation amidst the phantom-like presence of more than a half dozen limbless cats who haunt the perimeter of the chamber. In the meantime, a host of live animals sit nervously on the sidelines in anticipation of the scalpel. The presence of this image in the police state exhibition links vivisection to the same abuses of power found elsewhere in society. This is a point that Coe returns to again and again. The injustices experienced by any particular group are linked to larger systemic forces. The theme of animal rights has dominated Coe's work for much of the last 20 years. She was aware of the systematic killing of animals from human consumption at an early age, making it a natural subject for her to explore. Coe spent several years of her seven years of her childhood on the southwest fringe of Greater London in Hersham, where her family lived next to a hog farm and slaughterhouse. Quote, the smell of hogs seeped into everything, clothes and hair, she recalls. And she awoke every morning to the sound of screaming pigs. As Coe describes it, quote, slaughtering started at 4 a.m. We all woke up with the dog barking. The pigs created the most awful racket, screaming, piercing cries, sounds like screams in an echo chamber. There would be a crashing of steel. Then, toward morning, there was the heavy smell of blood, which hung in the air for two days. As a child, I thought they would slaughter all the pigs they had, then stop. I didn't understand the regularity of it, end quote. These reflections appear in Coe's 1995 book, Dead Meat, which focuses on the meatpacking industry in both text and image. She notes in the introduction that in the days of Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, packing houses were proud of their slaughtering techniques and offered guided public tours of their facilities. A century later, the larger slaughterhouses especially are guarded like a military compound, making it almost impossible to enter. Nonetheless, Coe has managed through a convoluted network of connections to gain access with her sketchbook and pencil in hand. She reveals the horror of what takes place in these facilities with unstinting graphic detail, confirming what we thought we knew, but showing us even more. The short lives of these animals are spent roughly handled. They are electrocuted with cattle prods, drugged up with hormones and antibiotics, branded, beaten with tire irons, chains, and noses pierced. They are driven mad by life imprisonment and forcibly separated from their offspring. They subsist for long periods of time without food and water. Their legs are frozen solid in their own waste. They die in transport trucks on the way to being slaughtered, all for the sake of human consumption. Her work is partly a record acknowledging these animals have been seen with the compassionate eyes of at least one human witness. They serve as 2D memorials that remind us that these animals lived. 
Foucault asks us to look at her subjects as beings not unlike ourselves. They are intelligent, capable of loyalty, understanding of their environment, and equipped with an entire range of emotions. As Stephen Eisman writes in his catalog for the Trout Gallery exhibition, the animals in Sukho's work are not stereotypes, but individual beings with feelings, motivations, memories, and longings. They are true portraits in which animals cower in fear, resist with all their might, cry, suffer, celebrate, and exult with all the particularity of humans. They are our fellow creatures, so Sukho seems to say, and our fates are inextricably linked as she makes clear in works that connect the systematic killing of animals with human genocide. Co does more than make us empathetic witnesses to the suffering of animals. She works to expose an entire system that exploits its workers, destroys the environment, and contaminates the food chain, all for the profit of, for, of a few. No one escapes the effects of this toxic industry. Animals bred in close confinement require heavy doses of antibiotics to prevent disease. These drugs then enter the food chain and breed resistant bacteria. The resulting mutations in animal disease, such as swine and bird flu, permit deadly viruses that come back to infect humans. Co also reminds us that the meat industry is highly inefficient. It requires 16 pounds of grain and over 12,000 gallons of water to produce a single pound of meat, which is exponentially more than a pound of plant-based protein. The industry's lack of sustainability pushes the stakes in Co's critique even higher. In her latest book, Cruel, the artist presents her audience with an unambiguous choice between accommodation and abolition when it comes to the human consumption of animals. She is dismayed by leaders in the animal protection movement who have worked with the meat industry to incrementally improve the conditions of food animals. In Coe's view, such halfway measures do not address the inherent injustice of a system that breeds, tortures, and kills living creatures for humans to eat. Nor do labels like cage-free, free-range, or organic have any impact on the lives of most farm animals. For Co, the locavore and happy meat movements merely add another premium level to the food industry's existing market. What has to change is the underlying issue of the human desire for power and control over other living beings. The only solution is to end the production and slaughter of food animals, a position she defends by arguing that all social justice movements ultimately strive for abolition. Of course, the artist acknowledges that such a pervasive and powerful industry can only be eliminated slowly over time. To begin, individuals must put themselves in the presence of other beings without power and bear witness. Just standing on the butcher floor changes the situation, she explains. In short, we must try and see reality without inventing anything. We must open our eyes and not forget what's there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Stephen Eisenman. I'm the curator of the exhibition, and uh, this is Sue Co. So not, we're on, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to ask a, a few questions. We'll have. A, we know we've had years of conversations. Uh, we've actually argued about how many years rouse. it is and rows. Um, so hopefully we won't have a row now, but, but you'll be uh, ha part of this conversation uh, sort of resumed in the middle. And um, I hope that it'll be illuminating. And um, can I start by asking you a question? Oh, if I can say something. Please. That was really brilliant, that person that said all that without even talking to me. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> And I'd also like to mention that Gary Francione and Anna Charlton are in the audience. It's not my invention, abolition. Uh, the founder of the abolition movement is here, sitting here. It's a great honor to have him and his partner. Um, so if there's any questions about abolition versus welfare, just Google Gary Francione abolition, and then you'll find out much more information. 
um, that's all. Go ahead. Great. I'm glad you said all that. Um, Thanks. Okay. I'm going to uh, ask a couple of questions about art and then a couple of questions about animals, and hopefully they'll wind up melding together. And we may not even get to the full question because you'll interrupt me and change it. But, um, <laughs> but, I, but I, this is how I want to start. Um, uh, it seems to me that your work, uh, the content of it, is very challenging and very difficult, sometimes difficult to look at because you're seeing images that are violent, bloody, in which animals are being destroyed and we feel their suffering. There's a great um, suggestion that we feel empathy, which we do for those animals. And to do that as an artist is a very difficult thing because uh, there's two uh, opposite difficulties and challenges. I want to see how you uh, tell me how you negotiate these. On the one hand, there's the difficulty that if you make it very difficult indeed and very challenging and very bloody, that the audience, while they're being given an image of truth, will so recoil that they can't look at it at all. And they can't learn anything from it because all they are is repulsed. And uh, that's a temptation that lots of artists have faced and resisted over the years, over the centuries. So that's a difficult thing. On the other hand, if you produce an image that creates a certain amount of pleasure, and yet your subject matter is the suffering of others, so the suffering of animals, then in a sense, you are heaping insult upon injury, where you could say that even the dead aren't safe if you're showing animals and the audience is receiving pleasure, aesthetic pleasure, from the image of their suffering. And yet you somehow, it seems to me, find some place in between those two extremes. So I guess my question is, how do you do that? Do you have checks upon yourself? Do you show it to others to say, is this too tough? Is this too, too culinary, too tasty, too delicious as a, as a drawing? How do you work that out? Um, well, when one draws in a slaughterhouse or hospice or prison, there's a level of trauma going on from the artist. Right. And so what I want to do is re-traumatize everyone else. I get enjoyment out of that. So having trauma is having acid. If you're an etching plate, you get acid thrown on the etching plate and it eats into your brain. And so what do you do with an etching plate soaked in acid? You make a print out of it. And the person looking at the print feels a part of what you saw. Um, so part of the mission is not, th in the artwork, is not that you look at, OK, say we're looking at each other, which we actually are. You're not looking at my eyes and saying, Sue has blue eyes, which sadly I do, I'd rather they be brown. You're looking through my eyes. Right. So the work is you're looking through my eyes. You're not looking at me. And that's, the great, that's what I'm aiming for in the work. And I reduce the color because I don't want you to see my blue eyes. I don't want you to make note of the pastel, what you may call it, sky view. I want you to look through my eyes so you're in the slaughterhouse with me. And is that an answer? Yeah, so, so we experience what you experience through your eyes, but transformed, because you're showing it in black and white. Well, we've said technique is a test of sincerity. So we could all say I can draw, let's say, for the sake of argument. But I'm not a brilliant artist. I'm just an average artist where the content is the driving force and I've reduced any decor. So it's the simplicity and elegance of black and white, mostly, although I have weaknesses for color and a little weakness for kitsch or sometimes. It's not big or mystery. It's only 10% mystery. That's all I allow in the art. So if, if you uh, move between those two poles that I described of images of horror and mm -hmm. then receiving a sense of pleasure, if we feel that we're in between that, it's because you yourself are there. That is, when you look at those scenes, you are not really horrified. You're able to distance yourself in such a way that you don't feel disgust or horror. Well, if I'm horrified in a slaughterhouse, then uh, I'm going to be thrown out. And I've also then let down any people that got me in that slaughterhouse where they're risking their jobs. Hmm. So anyone that gets me into those places is risking their job they're going to be fired. Um, 
or even in uh, in any or a prison, if I um, show anything um, in an emotional reaction, I'm risking right. the person's reputation. Right. Um, so it has to be very carefully done. So I'm hmm. looking after the person that's got me in to not betray their confidence. All right. So that means Is that, that the there's question? a yeah. So in other words. Uh, you have to distance yourself to some degree to do of the course, job you do, yeah. and therefore, if we see a distancing, it's because you have experienced that distancing, that self-distancing. Um, the other thing that you do is you often um, introduce a level of metaphor in the images, and I was describing this, um, for example, in your drawing, um, a butcher, which I think is one of the most powerful, and uh, it's downstairs when you first walk in, you turn right, you see it straight ahead and it has the, the word butcher in red, uh, written in, in factur in the German script. Right. Um, uh, I think it's one of the most powerful drawings there. Yeah, and one of the reasons I, I like it so much, and I hope it isn't, I sort of don't trust myself when I feel this way, but there's a level of metaphor there, and that is, this, that is that there's a lot of intermediaries in looking at that work of art. The intermediaries would be, and the uh, art history students here, will be gratified by these names I'm going to drop. Mm -hmm. And others of you may be alienated, but names like Plyowolo, Battle of Ten Naked Men, or uh, George Gross, or Otto Dix, the German Expressionist artist, or Max Beckmann. These artists, and, and, uh, and Rembrandt, they're images of um, uh, figures holding up axes, about to destroy an animal. Um, images of cruelty, uh, distorted expressions. One thinks of German Renaissance painters all these distorted expressions that, uh, to me, takes me to someplace far away from that yeah. actual scene. You're very smart. That's why I got you to do the catalog. <laughs> you know, you have a, you know, you have a perspicacity that's very um, refreshing and an intellect that goes with it. Thank you very much. Welcome. But so, so, so what is the, so, what, so these artists that I see there, of course, I'm an art historian looking at it, and you, in a way, yeah. are an art historian. And I can answer this question. Please. I've just been to Museum Modern Art, and most of their shows suck. They're just right. boring, pointless right. crap. Right. Okay, so I went to the show. It was German Expressionist prints, prints I'd never seen before. Uh. I went back home that night. I sketched it in front of the Museum Modern Art. I sketched the drawing I was looking at, the poster. Right. Went back home, and this is the danger. Um, I knew then I had to go back into a slaughterhouse fast, uh. right away, to go back to reportage because right. that loads up into art history right. and I can do art history too. Right. I don't remember the names though, but then you need to go right. back to drawing. It's too much art history. It's too much art history. It's like a feast, but that's what yeah. that museum show was like. Right. And there's a Colwitz show on in the Galerie Saint-Étienne right. this month and I'll go there and I'll go feast, feast, gorge, gorge. Right. Right. And when we move from the immediacy of the reportage, um, this is too art history. Go into the politics, the end of okay. capitalism. All right. All right. So, all right. So, the, so I'll, I'll, let's put aside. So then just, I was going to move to the, to the animals and to the politics. Okay. Um, you've worked on political themes, apartheid, um, the AIDS crisis, which is a political theme as well, the, the uh, purposeful uh, overlooking of the growth of a plague in uh, New York and the world, etc. Uh, you deal with issues of inequality and, of course, the, the animal thing. Are these separate things that you do? Like when you, do you move, do you say, okay, this is my, my concern about apartheid here. I'm finished with that, that's over. And then I have the AIDS crisis thing here. I've done that one. Now I'm moving to the animal stuff. Is it all one project? Is there an overarching it's all one project? project? But so much of this work is to do with access. That's part, that's half of this work, is getting the access. So I could be working on access for five years. You know, how do you get access to maximum security prisons? How do you get in? Because to get into a prison takes one and a half hours of three security checks. Who's going to go with you? How are you going to draw? How are you going to deal with the people? You have to establish trust. You have to establish dialogue. Because I draw, I use a pencil, they can see what I'm doing. There's nothing stolen from their lives. If they don't like the drawing, they can have that drawing, it's destroyed. Right. So, so much of the work is not necessarily, oh, I think I'll do that today. 
it's, you know, people telling me you have to do the Palestinian struggle. And I said, I have no real access. It's just going to be a superficial comment, so what? So what you're not seeing in that show is the amount of labor it takes to get into those places. Like we were just talking about um, Abu Dhabi. I went there to go there. I need to get into the slaughterhouse. They got me into the um, slaughterhouse there, but it wasn't easy. Can you imagine women in Burqa going to slaughterhouse? This is going where no woman has ever gone before. And so you have to, you have to work with people respectfully to, um, they do, people do an enormous amount of work so they can get into those places. And then another enormous amount of work showing this basically unsellable art. So for everything, everything you see that gallery is beautiful up there and the catalogue is like magical and the design, I couldn't even make it better than it is. I mean, not that I could anyway. But then there's a hundred other people that are my comrades that are helping me every inch of the way, you know, and, and reminding that art, just looking at it, uh, when we bombed the mental hospital in Grenada, people in Grenada wanted that work. It, funnily enough, it goes to the place it's supposed to. You know, I get emails saying, from Grenada. You know, so even though there's no great push behind the work, it's not Jay-Z or anything, it gets to where it's supposed to get. So for every single piece of drawing, every bit of drawing, there's a thousand people um, making this happen. There's a million animal, animal rights activists all over the world making this happen. You know, emailing me say, I can use that image on a poster in Madrid, Madrid, France, Australia. They're going for the content. They don't know art. They don't know George Gross. They want that poster to advertise their event. And that's the genius of this. That's the brilliance of doing this imagery. It's that it spreads, and people that can use it can use it as an activist tool. Amazing. Like, we've got the great catalogue. Now we've done the fundraiser for the local group here with the prints. So even though I'm only here a few days, we can raise money for a group to save, save lives. Right. And it's not to do with the art. The art's OK. The art's good. Some of it's great. Not very many. You know, a few are great. Majority are not. You know, what are you going to do? Can't always be genius. But it's art that's, it's art that's activated by humans. It's activated by you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to raise one more uh, issue, and then I know that all of you have many questions, so I want to leave lots of time for that. And that is that um, uh, there's one challenge that you face that may be the most difficult of all, and that is uh, looking at the underlying structure uh, beneath all these issues you address. So the fact that uh, animals are turned from living sentient beings into this product, call it meat or food or a product or commodity, and they are sold for a certain value, and it makes a certain new group of people very rich, and it destroys the animal lives, and it destroys the health of people, and it destroys the planet. And then you have other groups of people who are arrested and put in jail for, say, drug crimes or other petty crimes or more major crimes, who come out of contexts of, of violence and poverty, and they are considered to be throwaway people, unnecessary people, disposable people perhaps because of the color of their skin, or because of their gender, or race, and other reasons. And you deal with questions about imperialism, and about the power of the United States, whether it be in Grenada, or the power of the South African regime, former South African regime, to impose a system of apartheid. You deal with these large issues, and they, uh, underlying all those, is a certain set of economic and political forces. We can call it capitalism, in short. Uh, capitalism stands for many different things. And I know you're concerned about really making the changes, all these uh, individual things, through larger structural changes. But how do you talk to students who've never even heard the word capitalism used? Or uh, well, words... it's socialism they haven't heard. Well, that, that's true. They've heard plenty from capitalism. Well, they've heard from capitalists, 
But rarely is capitalism seen as anything other than nature, as the way things must be. So how do you bring that kind of really large theme, which we have to understand if we are to understand all these local injustices, because even though uh, the torture of animals is one of the vast, in fact, perhaps the greatest uh, rights issue of our day, I nevertheless, agree. it is one among several. Uh, of, about which uh, capitalism is the overarching structure. How do you bring that structure into the minds of audiences through works that deal with these individual processes? Sorry, is that, is that too long of a, too long winded a, a question? I'm sorry. Well, let's talk about the revolution. Let's right. analyze it okay. in the most optimistic way possible. Right. The social conditions will create the resistance. Right now, we have shock. Shock and awe, really, at what the corporations are doing. Um, once the social conditions worsen, which they will, capitalism is its, in its end stage. How long will it take to collapse? We don't know. I mean, we could always, it'll do it by itself. We, don't, we can just sit here and watch. It'll do it by itself. We don't have to actually do anything, but we can help it along a bit. Um, so we analyze everything. You know, Bertolt Brecht said, you rob a bank, you get 40 years in jail. You create a bank, you get rich. So, <laughs> what was the question? Well, the question was, was, <laughs> the question was how, you, how you open up to students. Because the other day, we were, had this uh, nice lunch with a, with a group of students. And you said something about, you know, the real problem, the real crisis is the this uh, end stage of capitalism, and I'll not forget wh exactly what else you'd, and there was a, a moment of kind of stunned silence on the part of the students, because to hear somebody come in and to speak about these things in a proper academic setting is really rare. And so I just wonder how you have managed, or how you've tried, or where, where you've succeeded. Yeah, well, that's why I don't have a job teaching. <laughs> I can do it, I can do it. I mean, they wiped out anyone that's, um, I was a union organizer or um, anything to do pro-labor. That was done in the 50s. Yeah. So, so for Dickinson College to... Well, the it's stage changing. That it has. I, I spoke with the person, the new person. You mean the, the yeah. new person here? Yeah. Uh, you mean uh, the president here? That's what I mean. And, and you, I and got you, the definite impression right. we're in for radical change. I mean, she's intelligent. Right. That always right. helps. Right. You know right. that. Right. 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 There's, there's an actual mind, there's an right. actual active right. mind at right. work right. that right. recognizes contradiction. Right. That's, 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 a, that's a big thing. That's How did she thing. get the job, we might ask. Well, my, she, I mean, <laughs> why am I here? This is like a fluke. I thought, I thought we'd better really open it up. <laughs> and thank you guys. <laughs> Questions, Questions from... <laughs> <laughs> students, students should go first. Students' questions. Please raise your hand. Come on now. There's, I see a. That was almost a raised hand there. I am. Hello. Hi. Yeah. I'm not a student, but I'm going to go first because oh, okay. I raised my hand first and nobody okay. else uh, joined in. You have just uh, articulated a great deal of. Um, it sounded to me like gratitude, but certainly indebtedness to tons of people who make it possible for you to have access to even get in to the places to to get the material for you to project. Um, it would seem that there's a bit of a contradiction because many of those people have to be the people that are on the floors doing the slaughter. Is that, am I misunderstanding that? Yes. Okay. Usually they're brothers or cousins of someone that works there or knows someone who knows someone that works there. So they, you know, in these talks I give the talks, they go, well, I can get you into a slaughterhouse. And they go, okay then, let's do it. And then they'll get me in, or someone invites me, and then I say, well, I'll come for free, or you're pathetic, whatever they're offering me, if you can get me into this place. So I, 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 help, I enable them to enable some sort of truth and justice to go on. Um, so you would say that the people who 
to whom you're indebted are not anyone that's actually affiliated with whatever organization you're infiltrating, as it were. It's not infiltrating. I, I don't mean it. I'm sorry, bad exciting. word. That sounds exciting. Okay. <laughs> infiltrating. Oh dear. Let's let's okay. take another word and just get in which uh, people who make who yeah, are working at the place yeah. where you are visiting. Um, are these not? Are these not? And although I, well, I guess the question I'm getting to is, at a certain extent, are you not critiquing the people to whom you are indebted? No, because the workers in packing meat packing plants are any of us. They're just any of us under different conditions. They're no worse, no better. I mean, Stephen disagrees. We have a meat packer here. Yes. Right. Um, I, I kind of I kind of disagree sometimes because I feel like people whatever their background, whatever their social class, have a responsibility for what they do. And while I understand the reasons in which yeah. uh, illegal Chicano workers in it's Colorado... It's undocumented workers. Indeed. Uh, uh, work in yeah. slaughterhouses. Nevertheless, they are doing that thing. And Wait a second. I'm going to have to interrupt my comrade. Um, what the average lifespan in a meatpacking plant is six months. They have no idea what they're getting into. They go in, they're injured, horrified. Um, there's very few that have a lifespan in a slaughterhouse for very long. So I'm, I'm not justifying them. I'm saying they are as rep replaceable as any battery hen. And my focus sure. isn't on them, but on the economics that creates the system. Now, we as consumers can move towards consumer choice to create change. That's very, very important. You know, but if I'm with a liberal meat eater who can read the New York Times, let's say, but I don't mean you, because I know you read the Times, but they're liberal, they're really nice, and they eat meat, and they're sensitive. Um, is that preferable to some human being that is that's the only job in town and they hate it and they're, they're really, um, right. you know, they all have carpel tunnel. Um, they have marginally more rights than the other animals in right. there. Right. But the, what I get from them, and I, you can't generalize about anybody, we are the battery chickens. All of us are the battery chickens. That the forces are experimenting on you to see how much you can bear before you stand up. So we are all in our little cage, and they're in the, the people getting into those situations are in their cage. And don't forget, everything is fluid. That when I'm in that situation and they're talking to me and they're seeing me draw, they're changing too. So we're changing each other by that dialogue. And um, that's the magic of drawing, is that they can see what I'm doing. I'll do their portraits. I'll do their, you know, here's a portrait. I'll do it outside for you. We're standing outside. And, and then we go back in, and I talk some more. And they could start to change. I was just telling uh, Stephen that, you know, when I was with meat packers, uh, slaughterhouse workers in the um, the last slaughterhouse I was in, in, I said to them, can you imagine a world without meat? And they said, yes. And then I said, when's it going to happen? And they said, soon, because I'm actually dying from eating animal products. So they had a greater imagination than about the end of meat than so-called pragmatists working for these large pimping animal groups, right? That's saying, oh, let's get people in Meat Free Monday and uh, let's do Meat Free Monday. I mean, fuck them. You know. <laughs> so, sorry, yeah, yeah. dear, sorry. I'm a vegan, so I'm, yeah, I'm with you. Vegan. So let's forget Meat Free Monday. Let's go meat free, animal products free every day of the week. People aren't babies. They never get to hear, they never get to hear the truth. Challenge people. You know, challenge people to go up. Because 
Those slaughterhouse workers are killing themselves making this product. Sorry, that was an instant question. <laughs> and I just think we're constantly undermining our own message when we talk about, oh, that's free range and that's some backyard chicken. I mean, you're an animal slaver. That's all you are. I don't care if you're a corporation, you're still playing the same game of trying to make this a marketable product. So no more animal husbandry. Don't I'll stop. No, that's great. You can have your talk. No, I don't want to. I was that No, was no, great. no. I was He's so brilliant. That's don't his... pretend. He's the the brilliant part of that yeah, catalog. Right. It's not it uh, is you are the brilliant part. Anyway, uh, he is he's just more Yes, as a student in the middle of the later. Do you think that it's easier or harder as a woman to get into the slaughterhouses? Like versus say a man trying to do what you're doing? I think it's harder. I think it's a lot harder because it changes the whole dynamic because it's 100% male. So I think it's harder as a woman. I think it's um, um, what the positive part of being female is no one ever asks you any questions. I'm very rarely asked a question. I'm 62. I mean, I could show up in a bar now, like semi-drunk, any bar around here, and I could sit at the bar and I could say, and how are you? And they'd say, oh, and they'd tell me. They wouldn't say, how are you back? They'd actually tell me how they are, and it would go on for an hour. And then I'd go on to my second question. And I could, that's the brilliance of being female. You're constantly gathering information. Because <laughs> <laughs> so honestly, I think it's harder, but once you're there, um, and the meat packers have never been asked any questions ever, really. So if you ask them about themselves, how they got there, what they think about what they're doing, um, they're very, very, um, they can see what the animals are going through. They're right next to the animals. They know what goes on. They know, in fact, the meat packers union said, um, when they speeded up the lines again, said they don't even give the animals enough time to die. They know what's going on. They know what's going on. So let's give them better jobs. Let's give them a really great job where they don't have to do this. Yes. Yes, in the back. Hi, how are you? Good. Okay, okay. Um, I'm an ex Dixonson student. I graduated in 2011. Love your work. Thank you. Um, my question is, this individual at the beginning talked about how your artwork, at least in this exhibit, strikes a balance between the viewer experiencing aesthetic pleasure and it being so aggressively explicit or overt that the audience recoils was the word you used. Um, I, actually, I actually disagree and I think that your work, at least from my experience, is so explicit and overt that at least me, I do recoil and I do feel intense emotion and it is that extreme and that overt and when I see illustrations with words like go vegan or v eat vegan and no one gets hurt. Um, I'm wondering as the artist, does it cross your mind that this is so overt, so explicit, so extreme, that the very people you're trying to reach may be turned off by such intensity, such an explicit nature in the art? It, it almost, almost, not quite, Thank but you. it almost says to me, go Democrat, go left wing, get liberal. And this well, is the dreadlock dude. One, you were talking about one piece of art. No, I'm talking that. about multiple. There's one that says There's go another vegan. one? 
Pardon me? Does two say go vegan? <laughs> Absolutely. One says go vegan, the other say, says eat vegan and nobody gets hurt. So that's my question to you. Are, are you afraid that the, the explicitness, that the, how overt this is, is turning off the very people you're trying to reach? Because right now, you are conspicuously preaching to the choir. The people in here are on board, sweetheart. How we many vegans are in the audience? Pardon me? How many vegans? I know I'm sitting next to one. Okay, so that's one, two, three, four. You call this a choir? This is going to be actually a quartet, <laughs> sweetheart. <laughs> I mean, but anyway, I, I love, I lo and, and I do love your work. I do love Thank your you. work. Thank and, you. And I would love to hear your response to that, not how many vegans are in the room. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think a lot of the work you're talking about with the explicit, um, there's no tele texting text, comes about because 99% of the message is, oh, don't go vegan. You know, it's what I said before. It's like, oh, it's okay, just, it's okay, just, you're okay, just go to Whole Foods, baby, and just, you know, eat that free range. So I'm getting more strident because I've been doing this for about 30 years and I'm not seeing what I should be seeing. I'm not seeing the progress I should be seeing because we have a revolutionary, let's say we have a social justice movement that's now been taken over as a charity. The biggest donor group to a charity are the bourgeois class who are meat eaters. So that strident message has not only been crushed, but buried. So I think that work, which you rightly said can put people off, is in the context of continuously dumbing down the message that to breed animals just to murder them is wrong, and we need to change it. So I agree with what you say, um, in part, um, but you know, this. We all, need to, we all need to do our activism in the way that we feel passionately linked to. We're not all going to do it the same way. So I've got colleagues who I respect who are much more, um, what's the word, gentle. Um, and there's plenty of those. There's not, so let's see what works. Let's give strident a bit of time because we haven't had any strident. We've had, let's shop at Whole Foods, you're so good for shopping at Whole Foods and paying 10 times more for something, you know, and making that Mackie right, rich. Right, right. I mean, forget that. I mean, forget that now. Right. Let's have a bit I'll, of strident. I'll See I'll if add. it works. If it doesn't work, I will change it, okay? Thank you. I just want to add, Welcome. Just want to add one more thing about your good question, and that is that we're used to the idea that art is supposed to be useless. That's the history of art for at least a couple hundred years, since the Romantic period, since around 1800. If it's useful, if it tells a particular story, we don't want it anymore. So in a way, what Sue is doing is not just saying, let's give stridency, if you will, a chance, but she's also changing the definition of what art is supposed to be. Maybe art can actually be specifically engaging concrete issues, spaces in time, politics, power, economics, and still be art. And that's a challenge to lots of you students who are artists. That's fair. The last thing I'm going to say, and I really do love your work, and Thank today you. walking through Thank your you. exhibit really does make me question my actions. It does. And I think, I think that's something you would agree with. That, that's the point. Can we get people to change? Sure. But um, for me, I think, and you're, you're, we, we keep using the words like, can we challenge people? Can we engage people? I think when someone can experience art and and figure out for themselves and not be told that that's when true change, true engagement is enabled. People are too, we are too egotistical an organism to be told what to do. People hate to be told what to do. And I love your vision, I love your goal, but I think we need to, we need to be delicate in how Delic we allow people okay. to take our side our side. And that's all. Thank you, though. All right. Thank you. Other questions? Any more?
This one down here. Hi. Uh, what inspires you? Are, you? are you working on a project now? What are I'm you, thinking what about are you Snowden, Assange, and um, um, Manning. I'm thinking about the NSA and how to get this in visuals. I'm thinking about the Guy Fawkes mask. Where did it come from? Anonymous. I'm thinking about those particular computer programmers have more in common with each other than they do with a flag. So they can never be broken, they can never be bought. So I'm thinking many different thoughts which will come together either in really sucky, stupid imagery like a big eye looking down <laughs> or could be something a bit better, we don't know. That's what I'm thinking about now. Like, where did those masks... Like, I know it came from V, the Guy Fawkes mask. But how are we going to show this? You know, because you get a lot of people saying, I don't care if they're, they're, they're reading my email. I, I'm not doing anything wrong. See what I mean? It's like how to get people to understand globally what's happening. And it'll probably be sucky. I'll, I'll probably just do some crap thing on it. I don't I'm know. Sure you won't. We'll see now. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for being here and for sharing. Um, my question is related to something that you just you said um, earlier, which I found also um, we don't hear that often. You refer to this stage of capitalism, you refer to, let's see how much can we bear, right? Like we are in sort of a continuum to, you seem to suggest, to something that in a way you can, you can see, right? Um, as an artist, um, I was also struck by um, what you mentioned about the workers and, and, and say they see that. And so, I was wondering, I, I cannot claim that I'm familiar with all your work, but I was wondering if, if you can talk a little bit about that process of access to that next stage, like the access to imagination, like the end of meat, or, um, yes. Um. Well, if I didn't meet, if I, if I didn't meet young people, I just, just cut my throat, you know, but as I meet so many kids, um, I just have such optimism that it's, they know so much more now, and there's, so I have optimism, but I can't, you know, in terms of art, any paintings of the resurrection were terrible. You know, every artist wants to do the crucifixion. Have you ever seen a good resurrection painting, really? I mean, the colors, just D Descent into hell is always good. Descent into hell. I was That's... going to say that you read my mind. Eisenheim altarpiece. You have the, one of the greatest paintings of all time, which doesn't really show Christ. It shows a plague victim. It was in a hospice. It was for plague victims to see the green body, the scabs, and he had the herbs at the bottom to heal people who were suffering from the plague. And then at the, part, the back of the panel is the resurrection. It's terrible. Um, it's as good as any resurrection, but I think our job is to show the decline of the bourgeois world um, because we're living in it. And there's better artists to show the resurrection. Um, there's better artists to show the dream, because I'm fueled by hatred and rage. Um, <coughs> what are you going to do? I've tried. I'm from a Hersham housing estate. I've tried being a Buddhist. It only lasts for a few days. <laughs> there's better artists than me to show the, this future that can do it in a genuine way. Um, I can only show the decline of the bourgeois world. That's why you fixated on that go vegan because it's totally like squishy, cute stuff. Right. I can't do it. Yeah. I think rage is a great motivator in, in academia and art, you know, and I'm always asking my students, 
what makes you, because you know, they'd say, what am I going to work on? I don't know how to write a dissertation. What should my senior thesis be? What should my art you know, project be? Hey, what makes you really mad? What really drives you, you know? And that's the way to get at something. So yeah. I think that's kind of what you do yeah. your whole life. You've done that. Fuel, yeah. yeah. Is it over now? <laughs> <laughs> When's the money have, dropped in the past? I think we're <laughs> <It's my back. laughs> okay. I got one more. Hi. Hi. I, I feel compelled to ask this question. Um, I work here. It's not here about at, deer hunting, is it? No, man. <laughs> no, it's one more about the uh, free range chicken. Um, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a farm here at Dickinson College where we raise free range chickens. And we do it in part to give students the opportunity to connect with animals that are going through the life process of of being a, a meat animal. Uh, we also ha have chickens for eggs that, are, that live their whole lives. Um, we, we help humanely. Uh, and we give students the opportunity to participate in killing and, and uh, eviscerating and, and processing chickens as a way to, to show them, if you're going to eat meat, this is what it, this is what it looks like, on, at least on a small scale. Um, and we try to do that process with respect, um, calmly, and, and the whole time, you know, from the time we pick up a chicken and put it in a box till, till we kill it and take its guts out, etc. We try to be respectful of the animal and, and we have customers here in the room that, that buy those chickens and eat them. The chorus, we talk about the, cor we talk <laughs> the chorus. I mean, the chorus is eating. So I, beings that have been map murdered, the chorus. Um, you know, I can't answer that because we need to get together, we need to talk, and the most important thing to me is the students who are drawing here need to witness what you're doing. And they need to have access, they're going to do it in a respectful way, but um, to make their series of work, I think that should be transparent. So. If you would allow the drawing students here, like you, you're perfect for this. I love this student, he's so great. He's just got such a perfect personage about him. <laughs> so, this student you can trust in that situation to be extremely respectful and kind. And, um, I don't know if he wants to do this, but I think these students should be allowed transparency and access and understanding. And I think, you know, you would be able to do that, just to educate and make the whole process transparent. Does that sound fair? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's what she's been waiting for. I'm never using you as a reference, by the way. <laughs> as Dickinson's president, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to Dickinson College's 2013 Arts Awards Ceremony. So prior to the interview and discussion we just heard, we were treated to a spectacular, spectacular exhibition in the Trout Gallery and an equally spectacular catalog written by Professor Stephen Eisenman. These events and those at the college during the past three days celebrate the dynamic art, dedicated activism, and remarkable career of Sue Ko. As a bit of background, the Arts Award was created in 1959 at the initiation of Dickinson faculty who wanted to recognize and celebrate the achievements of individuals or groups that have made an outstanding contribution to the creative or performing arts. The award was endowed by gifts from members of the Board of Trustees in honor of William Edel, president of Dickinson from 1946 to 1959. Over the past four decades, Dickinson has had the privilege of recognizing such significant individuals as Robert Frost, W.H. Auden, and Seamus Haney for poetry, 
John Barth and Robert Stone for literature, David Mamet and Julie Harris for drama, John Cage and Milton Babbitt for music, Twyla Tharp and Trisha Brown for dance, and Leonard Baskin and Le Leon Golub for visual arts. The award is a multi-day celebration of the artist's accomplishments while also involving her directly in classes, discussions, and meals with her students and faculty, all vegan meals. As part of our recognition of Sue Ko, she's participated in classes in drawing and printmaking with Professor Ward Devaney, given individual critiques to senior studio art majors with Professor Tard Arsenal, and held an open discussion forum in the ATS, and met informally with students and faculty in many occasions. So in selecting recipients of the Arts Award, faculty members seek individuals who personify the distinctive characteristics we value in a Dickinson liberal arts education. We seek those who have pushed the boundaries of their art and are not just widely recognized luminaries. We seek those who have reached across traditional lines to fuse the past and present into a new direction that requires a multiplicity of initiatives and abilities. And we seek those who understand that the arts, like a Dickinson education, can be useful in the sense that they expand and enrich our daily lives and in the case of tonight's Arts Award recipient, challenge us to question our moral and ethical beliefs as well as how we realize them or not through conscious action. Sue Ko exemplifies all of these qualities. As Phil Ehrenfeit, Associate Professor of Art History and Director of the Trout Gallery remarked, in the exhibition catalog, the theme of moral indifference in the face of great tragedy is central to the art of Sukkot. She often directs her message at indifferent bystanders, goading them on to action. It is impossible not to respond to the imagery that Sukkot puts before us. Hers is a moralizing vision of human choice and action in which suffering is a consequence, but not a necessity. As is the case with all successful art, Sukho's imagery demands that we question assumptions we take for granted and societal circumstances to which we have become accustomed. But indeed, as with all great art, her imagery is discomforting in the most positive sense. It requires us to see in a new way and to move beyond the familiar places to which we easily retreat in the face of hard choices. Sue's work, which includes art, books, and devoted activism, is an ideal metaphor of a Dickinson liberal arts education. Her extraordinary accomplishments exemplify the essential creativity and energy that come from always pushing the limits of one's discipline, making unique connections to establish new paradigms, and most importantly, assertively projecting and standing up for one's convictions and passions. As such, she is a model and an inspiration for our Dickinson students and we are privileged to honor her as our 2013 Arts Award recipient. Sue, will you come join me, please? So Ward has something special for you that he'd like to give you. What is it? <laughs> you, can't, you can't see yet. What is it? <laughs> Wait. <go ahead. laughs> On behalf of Dickinson College and the Department of Art and Art History, um, we'd like to present you with this print by Eli Jacoby, oh. who was an artist of the 1930s who spent a great deal of time in the Bowery. Uh, drawing the travails oh, that is of, so uh, but I have to read you. The, this is uh, a great drawer. The citation. This guy here. He's the best <laughs> drawing teacher ever. If I had him when I was your age, I'd be a lot better drawer now. <laughs> See, I looked at her work all my life. So. Well, not what does all it of say? it. Just... Boy, that's nice. So let me read this. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> In recognition of Sukho's art, her selfless activism, and her, human her humanity, and for the fearlessness with which she pursues all. You to have. Oh.
I want to thank you all for coming tonight, and thank you, Sue, for joining us here at Dickinson. I hope um, I hope this isn't the last time you grace our campus. Thank you, and have a good good weekend.